Hey guys and welcome to part 4 of my 3D integration tutorial mini series where I will show you step by step how you can create awesome visual effects like flying 3D bullets, UFOs or dissolving people into crows. In the last part of this series I discussed step 2 of the process and showed you how to use the 3D camera tracker in After Effects to track your footage and prepare the data for import into your 3D program. If you missed it you can check it out right here. Today I'm going to cover step 3 of the process and show you how to set up and render your scene inside your 3D program. As I mentioned in the last part, I am going to use 3D Studio Max for this part of the process because it really is the only 3D program I know how to use with yeah, some level of confidence. However, I am going to try to keep this tutorial as generic as possible because it doesn't really matter which 3D program you use. You may just have to check out a few other online tutorials or resources to figure out how to apply each of those steps to your 3D program of choice. Now, let's jump into 3D Studio Max and set up a cool 3D scene that we can then integrate back into our footage. This is not going to be a tutorial on 3ds Max. There are plenty of those available online already. Instead, I will focus on what we need to do to set up and render a scene that can then be composited onto your original footage. You should be able to follow the same steps in any other 3D program, though the way you set things up might differ slightly. I have a brand new project open here and the first thing we want to do is make sure that our render output format will match the footage. Go into your render settings and set the output width and height to match the resolution of your footage. I filmed the UFO scene in 1080p, but for performance reasons I am going with half that resolution, which is 960 by 540. For your final render you will want to bump this back up to full resolution. If you are familiar with 3ds Max, note that I am using the unflavored default scanline renderer. I am a big fan of the V-Ray renderer in terms of quality and functionality, but it does get a whole lot more complicated and I assume that if you are using V-Ray, you know what you are doing already anyways. Also, using the default scanline renderer means I can keep this tutorial more generic and that's a win in my books. Let's import the data we exported in the last step. The file we exported is a .ms file that contains our camera tracking data and the 5 null objects marking the opening in the foliage as well as the spot where I am falling over. To import this file, simply drag it from your file browser into one of the views in 3ds Max. Voila! You should now see a new camera and one dummy object for each null object layer you exported from After Effects. Note that the duration of our animation has been automatically adjusted to match the number of frames in the .ms file. And since we exported this .ms file from our footage, our project is now at the correct length. If this hasn't happened for you, just ensure that the number of frames in your 3D scene match the length of your footage. If you now scrub through your animation, you should see the camera move exactly like it did in the clip we tracked in After Effects. Yes, I'm sure you noticed that our camera is pointing downwards, which is certainly not the way we filmed the scene. This just happens because 3ds Max and After Effects use different coordinate systems and we will fix that up in a moment. For now, select the camera and go over to your camera settings. Now don't feel gypped. The basic camera in 3ds Max does not expose a lot of the settings I asked you to write down before filming your scene. All we can really set on this camera is the focal length and it has already been matched up by the camera tracker. I will leave it at roughly 45mm. If you are using a different 3D program or you are using V-Ray, you may see a whole lot of other camera settings that you can configure. From film gate size to aperture, white balance, shutter speed, ISO and more, ensure that you set this camera up as precisely as you can to match the physical camera you use to film your footage. Ok ok, I know it's been irking you terribly, so let's aim the camera in the right direction. Because the camera is keyframed for every frame of our project, we can't just rotate it. Otherwise it will simply snap back each frame unless we apply the rotation to all keyframes. An easy way to get around this problem is to select the camera and the dummy objects, go to group and group them all together. The name of the group is irrelevant, just rotate everything to face in the right direction. I do recommend not ungrouping them again, otherwise it might screw up your keyframes. Change the perspective viewport to use the camera's view. You should now see the dummy objects mark the exact same positions as our null objects did in After Effects. One marking the spot where I am falling over and four marking the opening in the foliage. Yep, looks like everything is correct. To help us with setting up our 3D scene, let's set up the background for our camera viewport to show our actual UFO footage. Make sure the camera viewport is selected and go to Views, Viewport Background, Viewport Background. 
I'm pretty sure there should be a similar option available to you even if you're not using 3ds Max. Now select the background source. I have exported the UFO scene from the last part as a JPEG sequence. Select the first image, ensure that you tell your 3D program that this is an image sequence and that the number of frames for the background match your project. Then hit OK. To ensure the background gets updated as you scrub through your animation, ensure you tick the Animate Background option. We should now be able to see our actual footage as the background for the camera viewport and if you scrub through your animation, the dummy object should correctly follow the visual elements in the scene. Remember that our track data did not contain depth information. This means that the dummy objects do not represent the actual 3D positions of these visual elements and will only follow them properly if seen from the camera's point of view. Note that this background image won't actually be rendered, it is just a tool to help us align the 3D objects with our footage. Let's finally add the UFO into the scene. I'm not good at modeling in 3ds Max, so I went online and found a free UFO model on turbosquid.com that I will use for our effect. I put the link to this model in the description below. To import the UFO into your scene, simply drag the .max file into a viewport and select Merge File. Next, using the dummy objects as reference points, place the UFO at the correct position in the 3D scene, way above the tree line, visible through the opening in the foliage. Because I imported and moved the UFO at a frame halfway through the animation, 3ds Max has created a default keyframe at frame 0. I'm just going to delete that because I don't want my UFO to move, at least not yet. If we now scrub through our animation, the UFO should appear to be part of our scene. Let's animate it to enter the scene just as the camera is aiming up. For this, create a keyframe at a time when the camera is looking straight at the UFO. Move back until the UFO is completely off screen in the camera viewport and move the UFO back a little bit. I'm also going to rotate it slightly. Create another keyframe and don't forget to exit out of keyframe mode. The UFO will now enter our scene just as the camera aims up. That's pretty cool. Now, you probably want to assign some materials to the UFO to make it look really nice, but for this tutorial, I am going to assume that the alien race builds all of their flying saucers from a plain grey material that happens to look exactly like the default material in 3ds Max. Also, again, this isn't meant to be a tutorial on 3ds Max. Another thing we should probably do is enable the show save frames options on our camera viewport so the aspect ratio of the camera's view will be constrained to the aspect ratio of our output format. This will ensure that the background image won't appear stretched. Let's render out our scene and see what we've got. Yeah, that's pretty cool, but we still have to set up the lights we need to match our original footage. For this shot, this should be fairly straightforward because the only light source in the scene is the sun. Create a new light, I am going with free direct light here. Position it and aim it at your scene to simulate the sunlight. You may also want to adjust the intensity and the color to match the sun's brightness and color as precisely as you can. Now this render looks much better, however the underside of the UFO is entirely black. I am going to add a small omni light into the scene to fill in the black areas just a touch because the sunlight bouncing off the ground would create some sort of indirect illumination in this area. While this seems a little bit too bright, I will bring the Omnilight down a little bit more. It's subtle, but the underside of the UFO isn't completely black anymore and we're done setting up our 3D scene. One last thing I want to discuss before we hit the render button are different render passes. In 3ds Max you can set these up in the Render Elements tab in your render settings. Depending on what you need to realistically composite your rendered scene onto your original footage, you may require to render independent layers for things like diffuse, lighting, refraction, reflection, shadow, specular, z-depth or other elements. Our UFO scene is pretty simple and won't really require much fancy compositing, but I will still add a z-depth pass. A z-depth render is a grayscale image where the brightness indicates how close an object is to the camera. This is a z-depth layer from my turn to crows effect. Note that the crows closer to the camera are brighter and the crows further away are darker. Now why would you need this layer? Because it can be used as a track mat layer in After Effects to more organically combine stock footage pieces with your 3D elements. I usually always export it for any 3D integration effects I work on just in case I do need it and for the UFO effect we will actually use it. One important thing to set up for a correct Z-depth pass is the Z-min and Z-max parameters. These define the range in which the output color will be between white and black. I'm quickly going to use the tape helper in 3ds Max to figure out the distance from the camera position to just before the UFO and to just behind the UFO. These distances will be our Z-min and Z-max respectively. We now need to configure where all our render passes will be saved to and I am going to drop my Z-depth layer output files in this output directory. You usually want to output all of your render files in a format that contains an alpha channel. 
I usually like to go with the OpenEXR format and ensure it's set to 32 bits. If we now render out the current frame, we will get the default render, also referred to as the beauty pass, as well as a nice z-depth pass image. This all looks good, so we're ready to render our full animation. Set the project to export the entire time range and set up where the output files for your beauty render pass will be saved. Again, I'm going with the OpenEXR format in full 32-bit and then hit render. Now sit back and enjoy the show. And with that, we're done. But before I finish off this tutorial, let me quickly show you how to deal with objects that need to cast shadows. Here's the actual 3ds Max setup for my dissolve into crows effect. You can ignore most of the elements in the scene. What I want to show you is that I have reconstructed the geometry of the pier to scale in 3ds Max. This is exactly what you will need the scene measurements for. Now, you will have to ensure that your lights are actually enabled to cast shadows. There's usually a shadow option somewhere in the light settings available. Also, if you are using a shadow mat, you want to make sure that the resolution of that shadow mat is sufficiently high to give you accurate shadows rather than just blurry dark blobs. If we now render our scene, we will see all of the 3D objects and their shadows, but unfortunately, we also see the geometry of the pier. This will make it almost impossible to take this image and composite it with our original footage. What we actually want for the pier is to receive and show the shadows, but we do not want the actual pier geometry to be rendered. For this, we can use what is called a shadow matte material. This is a material that will catch any shadows cast on it, but will otherwise remain transparent. If we assign this material to the geometry of our pier and render out the scene, we will only see the crows. But if we have a look at the alpha channel, we can see that the render also contains the shadows of the crows. Once you are set up to render shadows in your scene, you can also add a separate render pass to render out only the shadows if you want to composite them independently. I have a shadow and a z-depth pass set up here and if you render the frame, we will get the beauty render, the z-depth path and one image containing nothing but the shadows. Now this image is ready to be composited with our original footage inside of Adobe After Effects. You should now have everything you need to set up any 3D elements you want with or without shadows and match them up to your footage. Once we've rendered out all of the passes, we are ready to go back into our After Effects and composite them onto our original scene. I will cover that step in the next part of this series. I really hope you enjoyed the fourth part of my 3D integration tutorial mini series. As always, please leave any comments, questions or suggestions in the section below. I will put up the next part of this series soon, so please subscribe if you want to see more or come and stalk me on Facebook or Twitter. Until next time, I will see you later.